NerdRotic.com. Welcome back to NerdRotic. My name is Gary, and I come to you from NerdRotic.com. And unfortunately, we need to talk about Star Trek Discovery Season 2, Episode 3, Point of Light, once again. Now, I did a live stream right after it aired. It's very visceral. It's very emotional. Link will be in the description. But for those of you who do not like to sit through the live streams, I do these short recorded videos. And I have slipped on it since then, and I thought maybe I could come at it with a reasoned approach. But no. This is the worst episode of Star Trek ever. It did more damage to canon than you could possibly imagine, specifically when it comes to Spock, one of the greatest characters ever created in storytelling, in fiction, destroyed in under 10 minutes. That's almost impressive. We had logic extremists remain Klingon. We had Klingon feminism. We had Tilly Silly Billy Tilly Willy winning a race and being positively affirmed three times in under one minute and Spock with hurt Fifi's. Let's get to it. There will be spoilers ahead and at this point I would tell you to go ahead and watch the episode before you watch this video but don't. You can do so many more productive things in your life like getting a parking ticket or quitting your job and becoming a YouTuber. Something like that. We start with Michael Burnham not being able to solve a problem. And I can hear everybody now, oh, see, she's fallible. She's not a Mary Sue. We all know that the problem was set up wrong by some tiny male brains. So she will later on go and set up a better problem for her to solve later. Because this show structurally was such a hot mess, I'm just going to go over the three storylines that were in this individually. And we'll start out with the least harmful, the Tilly storyline. Tilly, as we all know, is in the command training program because nobody is more fit for command than silly Tilly. She's running a half marathon in the Discovery, and I guess part of the training command is to turn the lights on and off while they're running very slowly through the hallways. Tilly sees the ghost of her friend May, and we need to stop right here. How does Tilly see an adult May when she acknowledges in this conversation that she only saw her in junior high for six months, then her mother took another job and they left? Of course, there's no mention of a father so it would make sense that the only version of may she would see is the last version she actually saw but again we're dealing with star trek discovery writers so i continue despite stopping for almost a full minute to talk to may tilly collects her thoughts in the blinky lights and wins the race now okay i'm not gonna make any comments towards tilly probably not looking like uh, an athlete in peak condition I just want you to focus on this guy, dude with 0% body fat. None of us are beating this guy in a race. I'm not beating him. My kids aren't beating him. Mrs. Nerdrotic isn't beating him. You're not beating him out there, but Tilly beat him. Oh, and let's not forget, Tilly did it in record time. We hear in the background chatter that you can only see on closed captions. Saru mentions that she beat her personal best. So the previous record was Tilly's because Tilly is chariots of fire. The most amazing thing about this is Tilly is positively affirmed three times in a matter of 30 seconds. Saru says a lovely show of endurance and fortitude. Michael Burnham says you're amazing. And the ghost says there is no one I'd rather cheer on and support. Overly affirming characters is indeed a trait of fan fiction, which this certainly is. Tilly is now on the bridge portion of her command training, and May is distracting her again, talking about Captain Lorca, and Tilly informs May that there's a new captain here, and she says, no, this one is whiter and blonder. Tilly screams at May, and it looks like she's screaming at Pike, and she completely blows the program and quits. But what does she need to do? talk to Michael Burnham, and that's what happens. Tilly goes and pouts in her room, tells May to screw off. Tilly is crying. May doesn't recognize what tears are. Then she leaves the room. Tilly starts talking to Michael and tells Michael that she's been seeing a vision of her dead junior high school friend as a grown adult. And as it goes with this show, everybody just needs to talk to Michael Burnham because when Michael Burnham heard that May didn't recognize tears, well, duh, she's obviously real, not a ghost, not a product of a delusional mind, but a very insecure one indeed. So she tells her to go to Stamets. We figure out that May is a callback from season one when that piece of spore drive drops on Tilly's shoulder. Turns out May is a sentient spore from the mirror universe. Stamet sucks it out. It turns into a big black booger and Tilly's going to be okay and she's not kicked out of the commander training program. It gets dumber. 
Next is the Laurel Vaught Tyler storyline. And oh, this one feelings in hallways, feelings in corridors, feelings in palaces, secrets and feelings. We have the CW Klingons. On Kronos, Laurel and Vok Tyler are showing off the new D7 without any house insignias showing a united Klingon empire. And we all shout, remain Klingon, not so subtle. But didn't you get that wrong? Laurel is in power, but it's very tenuous. Other Klingons question the fact that she has a human as her torchbearer. They have some tough talk, and then they go back to their room. Vok Tyler then has a tender moment with Laurel. Laurel wants to know if he still wants her, and he says he feels repulsed when she touches him. Then he talks about more feelings and how he feels conflicted, being two beings in one body. But we did again get confirmation that Tyler is indeed dead. This is Vok in a Tyler suit, but he's turning into Tyler. So he's more Tyler than he is Vok, but he's actually Vok in a Tyler suit. Are we keeping track with this? Okay. You're confused, I'm confused, and then I remembered I don't care. But whenever anybody has a problem, even in the Klingon Empire, what do you do? Call Michael Burnham. Apparently, it's okay for a communication from the Klingon Empire to go to the super secret science vessel and get to the first officer without the captain knowing about it at all. Vok tells Michael Burnham that Laurel's power is tenuous at best and she better tell the Federation. She said she will. Then he says, I have really hurt feelings and I'm conflicted. She says to trust the woman. Obviously, to trust the Klingon behind the deaths of millions of people in the Federation. We get a half a season's worth of story within five minutes because I believe these writers are incapable of telling an actual story and we find out that there's a baby Vok and Laurel had a little Klingon baby before he had his species swapping surgery I also see a couple of things a little more clearly now or maybe a lack of one thing a little more clearly now Quick reminder, just in case you've forgotten one of the great things Star Trek Discovery has given us is Klingons with two Johnsons While that was one of the rare things that actually makes sense in this show we're right back to the stupid. Earlier on in the episode, Laurel instructs Cole to remove the paint from his face because there's no longer any houses and they're a united Klingon. The torchbearer does it himself because Laurel does not get her hands dirty. Apparently Cole knew they were going to do this and put surveillance paint on his face. Surveillance paint that you can't wash off. And that's how he found out that Laurel and Vok had a baby and he kidnapped it. And we'll give it up if Laurel gives up the chancellor's seat. When Laurel brings up the fact that it's very dishonorable to kidnap a baby, the Klingon retorts with it's preferable to treason because with his surveillance paint, he overheard the tiny male brained Vok Tyler calling Michael Burnham for help. During the exchange, of course, a battle ensues. There's multiple Klingons versus Vok Tyler and Laurel. And of course, Vok Tyler and Laurel win in one of the worst battle scenes I've ever seen shot in Star Trek. Again, lights are blinking on and off. And every time Laurel is about to make a battle move, the lights go dark or she goes behind some sort of beam. More Klingon reinforcements come in and then Laurel and Vok Tyler get captured. She is forced to sign over the chancellorship and then they are saved by Deus Ex Captain Emperor Georgiou. She kills the remaining Klingons. Laurel kills the last remaining Klingon, the one who actually looked like a Klingon. And then Georgiou promptly tells Vok Tyler to leave the room because the ladies need to talk. Go away, little boy. Georgiou tells Laurel that she needs to convince the tiny male brains of the Klingon Empire that she belongs on the dais, so she develops a plan. And her plan is to fake Vok Tyler's death and the little albino baby Klingon's death. And we get a great scene in this family-friendly show of Tyler's head and a severed baby's head. Laurel tells all in attendance that it was indeed Tyler who betrayed her, so they don't need to think that she is choosing a human over her loyalty to the Klingon Empire. Tyler killed the baby and her uncle, solidifying her position as Chancellor, but she wants a fiercer title. Does she choose Empress? Does she choose Queen? No, she chooses Mother. And we have Klingon Feminism. 
admittedly, they did warn us this is going to happen. We then go aboard the Section 31 ship where Vok Tyler and the baby, both alive and well, Vok Tyler is going to send the baby down to a Klingon monastery. I believe it's the same one that Worf went to, so that was a little callback there. Then, of course, the former space Nazi who ate Kelpians, who is now in a senior position of Section 31, offers a job to the Klingon in a human skin suit and... He's on board. At this point, I wish I could tell you I was done, but there's still a third storyline, and it is the Michael Burnham Amanda storyline. Amanda arrives at the Discovery and Sarek ship. At first, everybody thinks it's Sarek, and Captain Pike is worried that he ratted out his boy Spock to the Federation over his map of the red points of light, and somehow Sarek found out, but it was indeed Amanda. She sees Michael Burnham and promptly tells her in secret that she went to visit Spock. They wouldn't let her, so she stole his medical records, and she wants Michael Burnham to access them. They go to Captain Pike. Captain Pike, of course, is going to do it by the book. He contacts the captain at Starbase 5 via screen, and they take a little shot at the fans who have brought up, rightly so, that hologram was not around for years, and the captain of Starbase 5 makes a little joke that Pike and his Nina are the only ones who use view screens. We find out that Spock has murdered three people and escaped. Of course, Captain Pike, Amanda, and Michael Burnham do not believe this, but they need to find Spock before other people do, which I imagine is Section 31. Captain Pike orders Michael Burnham to access Spock's medical records. While we are accessing the medical records, we see Spock had drawn the Red Angel, Amanda mentions hearing it before Michael Burnham tells her that she has seen it as well. Then we find out what really happened between Michael Burnham and Spock. It appears that Spock adored Michael Burnham and he was her little shadow. But one day Michael Burnham ran away from home due to the heat the family was getting from the logic extremists. Yes, those Vulcan terrorists scared Michael Burnham away. Spock, being her little shadow, was in danger, and she felt the best way to keep him out of danger was to hurt him so badly he wouldn't want to be around her anymore. So she hurt Spock's fifis to protect him. And of course, Spock is still wounded because he's so weak mentally, probably because of his tiny male brain. Michael Burnham has reached out many times, but Spock is not interested. Amanda blames Sarek for raising Spock in the ways of Vulcan and admits she has given more love to Michael because she was not allowed by Sarek to give more love to Spock. So, of course, Spock was jealous, I'm sure. Something many Vulcans experience. Michael Burnham tells Amanda that she did do something to hurt Spock and Amanda actually gets mad and says she will go look for him instead of Michael Burnham. Mia Kirshner, of course, was in the L word. So when she gives Michael Burnham that kiss goodbye, I saw a little bow chicka wow wow myself in that. That was a little too long, wasn't it? So like I said earlier, this was just a hot mess of an episode. Three storylines packed into one hour. I'm betting this was one of those reshot episodes. I heard, if I heard correctly... It was the first five that needed to be redone and they needed to get additional money and that's why they did the shorts or that was one of the reasons they did the shorts. At least that's what Midnight's Edge reported. Something like that. I don't know if I'm exactly right on that. But it really feels like a hodgepodge. Um, the Tilly stuff, completely unnecessary. We focused on three female characters, which is fine. Uh, you know, the Vok was also a focus, but it was with Laurel. That was just to get him with Section 31. Nothing felt earned there. They just handed him the badge, let him go on. But that's how this show is written. It's fan fiction. There's too much positive affirmation in it, especially in something so dark. This was such a step back. Admittedly, the first two episodes were better than anything in season one, but this was season one revisited, dialed up to 12. Makes me think of the Film School Rejects article I saw the other day that Star Trek Discovery is bringing hope back to the show. I just reworked that a little bit. I did throw this on Twitter. Um, I, I can't show the bottom part of that picture. I'm sorry, but I don't want to show the severed baby head because, believe me, YouTube would demonetize it, even though CBS All Access does indeed advertise heavily on this channel. There's been a lot of kerfuffle going on with Star Trek these days. I saw that Bounding into Comics 
shared my is Star Trek Discovery canceled or was it an Anson Mount oopsie so thanks guys for putting that in there I really do appreciate that I have heard nothing new from my source so one says the show is dead the other one says it's still up in the air I will point out there were some meetings this week in Pasadena where CBS announced for all access The Stand, a premiere date for The Twilight Zone, April 1st, an additional season for The Good Fight, a perfect opportunity to announce a third season for Star Trek Discovery, and they didn't do it. Very interesting. Back to the episode, they did acknowledge while Pike was talking to that other captain about the view screens and talking on hologram, and I thought that was a bit of a slap to the fans. They did acknowledge the Klingons have hair. When Burnham was talking to Vox, she had mentioned that she heard the Klingons were growing hair again. I thought that was lame to do that in one sentence. When you had every opportunity to talk about the, why they look different, the Klingon baby, Georgiou acting completely different than she did in season one. Now, a former emperor is just okay playing spy, being a security consultant for the Federation, Laurel being a Federation puppet. So much for the hopeful Star Trek. And Spock, don't even get me started on Spock. Now, I went into this in detail on my live stream, but I'll repeat it here one more time. Spock and feelings. That is something you go to as a special story. Of course they've dealt with it before. Of course he's half human but he was trained in logic and him being jealous or hurt because of a sister he never mentioned, I am still looking forward to see how they fix this in canon. Now, we all know it will be a total cluster F when they do and, you know, just get your popcorn out at this point. Sarek being an overbearing father, if Spock had only talked to his mother about his emotions, he would have been better. Logic extremists bombing a library and scaring Michael Burnham so she runs away. And then I failed to mention that Spock was able to help find Michael Burnham because the Red Angel showed him. And man, the Red Angel's so gonna be Michael Burnham. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Hey, if you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, hey, thanks for listening this long. I have a website, nerdrotic.com. Please check us out there. And thank you for listening. Thank you to all the new subscribers. It's not even the canon violations at this point anymore. It's just bad. It's just a poorly written, bad television show. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the critics say about this on Rotten Tomatoes. And if it's in the 90s, a video is coming. One more thing, may the small folks sing songs of your greatness. Nerdorotic.com, please subscribe.